How do we know when we have COVID and not influenza? Now the questions were, how do you know you have COVID as opposed to influenza? The, <clears throat> the PCR tests evolved over time. The original PCR tests were on the CDC standard, uh, which uh, was claimed uh, by the CDC that it couldn't distinguish between influenza and not. Obviously, if one would have tested for influenza and SARS-CoV-2, which should have been done consistently, we wouldn't have jumped to the assumption that is COVID-19. Uh, but over time, the PCR test became fully FDA approved as diagnostic aids. And I do think the CDC was correct in putting out the recommendations to the in vitro diagnostic companies to keep the P PCR thresholds less than 28. So the point I'm making is not everything is bad in pandemic response. People want to absolutely slam the CDC and slam the FDA and everything. But in fact, what the CDC was very reasonable. But the manufacturers never did that. And they let these PCR thresholds, you know, some of the tests could run up at 45, what have you. My personal bias is that this is such an important diagnosis, took people off of work, had all these other social implications. We should have had confirmatory testing. That is antigen and PCR. Why not? You know, these became widely available. So. Okay, what's the next question? Um, is there... Oh yeah, so the, the, the tests are only, as I went through this morning, only FDA cleared for people with, uh, uh, you know, suspected SARS-CoV-2 infection that basically, you know, fever and all the constitutional symptoms that I showed on the slide. They're not cleared for routine use. This idea of... The, the other thing that never made sense is all these um, public disclosures of people uh, in various positions saying, well, I tested positive for COVID, as if they were bestowed something. They either have a clinical syndrome or, or they don't. <clears throat> uh, is there protection from a prior H1N1 episode? Not to my knowledge. Does CHX have any effect? Chlorhexidine as a uh, as a, I guess, an anti-infective <coughs> rinse. You know, I'm, I'm unaware of it. I don't know if Nate Jones is here. We do have some experts about nasal virucidal therapy, but I had, Nate was actually on a, a podcast with us, and he even said even dilute baby shampoo, believe it or not, has an effect. Yeah. So maybe some of you who are working in the nasal area know better than I do. Dr. Fleischer, uh, did you say where to get a reference book for homeopathics? Uh, there's several different sources. Uh, uh, there's homeopathic educational services, but what the book you want to get is any of the clinical repertories. The repertory is the compendium of symptoms, the rubric, the symptom, and then all the remedies that cause it. Um, cancer repertory, there's a lot of ones on the market. There's, a, uh, there's computer programs that have it. For your group, uh, what you want to get uh, is a repertory and look at the tooth section, and it's a, actually a very big section. You'll be able to get a very good idea of what are the symptoms that are relevant to be able to prescribe acutely. So there's now two questions for Dr. Sims, and then we'll open up to the audience. How do you evaluate or know how much vertical opening the patients need for success? You, you have to test them. That's all. I mean, everything, everything is uh, right then and there. I don't do any moles or previous moles or anything like that. Okay. Everything is right there. Um, they also want to know if you've had many CRPS patients and what's your success rate with them? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. What does it stand for? Uh, complex regional pain syndrome or reflex sympathetic dystrophy is what it, what it stands for. Uh, these patients have severe pain. If you rub a cotton cotton ball across their arm or across their leg, they're in severe pain. And a lot of times we've taken them out of pain because the, the pain, the pain, uh, the pain um, pathway also goes through the brain stem. And if there's a damage to an area in the brain stem or an excess signal going through the brain stem, it can cause the CRPS to um, uh, ease it, uh, elevate itself. So yes, I've, I've done multiple cases of CRPS. Okay. Dr. Sims, thank you for your work. And um, my question is, I noticed the number of tongue depressors uh, were used when you're measuring at what point the symptoms uh, subside. Um, that's for the vertical, but how do you also determine the AP position? Well, I, I make 
the, like I said, everything is done uh, right then and there. I don't determine that beforehand or afterhand. If there's an afterhand, word like afterhand. <laughs> anyway, we make a skeleton and then we uh, determine where they need to be. I watch them and uh, have them uh, solidify that right then and there at their second appointment. Uh, Dr. Sims, have you ever used cranial sacral therapy to position your appliance, the no. cranial rhythm? Uh, no, but I don't, I don't uh, disparage it. A lot of my patients have had cranial sacral therapy prior to them coming to see me. A lot of times, uh, because they have such a uh, malpositioned bite, it throws it off by the time they get here. So. Uh, if I had a cranial sacral person uh, at, the, at the same time, I would definitely use them. Uh, Dr. Sims, so is that appliance something that they would be wearing for life, or is there any way of restoring them to that yes, position? Yes, yes. Yeah. We get them to a point where their jaws are in the proper position. Once, they, once their jaws are in the proper position, and what happens is the muscles change because just like, just like you see those um, uh, 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 National Geographic and you see the African ladies with the, the thing in, the, in their lips, the muscles change, okay? It had to change over time. That's the exact same thing that's happening to these muscles back here, up here, back here. All those different muscles have to change. Once they change, uh, I tell everyone your back teeth will not touch, okay, because we're changing jaw position. Once the jaw position has changed and, and we've uh, changed uh, where the, uh, the nerve is being uh, irritated or compressed or damaged, then we can fix them uh, orthodontically from there. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, so she asked sort of my question, but um, this is clearly uh, not a biochemical deficiency that you're saying there's no cure with the NIA. So it's like a mechanical entrapment, uh, which sometimes is caused by uh, posture or gait or accidents, correct? Um, so... Even, even hereditary. Or, or her hereditary, yes. Um, how do you... I can see how the muscles and the neurovascular can heal from that entrapment by being open. Uh, have you restored some of these cases or orthopedically, oh, yeah. orthodontically treated these cases to where they will not need the appliance for the rest of their life? That's exactly what you do. Okay. Exactly what you do. Thank you. Uh, Dr. McCall, this is for you. Um, I have three questions. The first is, what's the uh, anticoagulant or the coagulopathy workup for post acute sequelae of COVID. And let me just take that first. Oh, uh, sure. I think D dimer <clears throat> has a prominent role. Remember, D dimer uh, or fibrin split products were always used as a negative, right? So if we thought there was a thrombus and it was negative, uh, that was the basis how they built the, all the Canadian clinical rules about ruling out DVT with a negative D dimer. Uh, there's been an, an explosion of positive D-dimer test, te, you know, prognostic studies, what have you, and they do apply in SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. We published one of them early on in the pandemic with the uh, Italians, where uh, you know they, in a sense, relate to other risk factors. In atrial fibrillation, we can use uh, what's called the CHADS-VAS score, and we actually show that the CHADS-VAS score was related to COVID outcomes because, in a sense, they're, they're almost kind of a prothrombotic uh, prognostic score. So D-dimer, I think, is in there. Many still measure CRP as a general measure of inflammation. We measure PT and BTT because <clears throat> we want to know about any baseline abnormalities. CBC, which is important because long COVID or certainly post-vaccine, there can be platelet abnormalities. Um, I think they're in there uh, for starters. I can tell you, in people with macro thrombosis, I just had a patient with a pulmonary emboli. I told him on the phone, I am finding more and more <clears throat> the literature supports this. There's underlying thrombophilias. There's no doubt about it. And we'll find it, factor V Leiden or prothrombin, variant 2021A. So, you know, your standard 
profile, and I do both blood and salivary testing because the salivary testing for the genetics can pick up a few more that the blood can't. Great, thank you. And then what's your threshold for ordering a spiral CT or VQ scan in a positive D-dimer? Do you, if, they have, if they're symptomatic, would you order Yeah, if they have uh, symptoms. Let it be symptom-driven. Uh, like this patient, he clearly had chest pain or pleural pericardial uh, uh, symptoms, uh, sometimes just effort and tolerance. The number of deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary emboli we are seeing with the respiratory infection, recurrent respiratory infection, and with the vaccines and with both is through the roof. So have a low threshold. The only question we had in this case I had today was how long could this have been here? And we actually clinically were, were missing it. So great, great questions. So the third question is what's your anticoagulation of choice? I guess it depends on whether they have PE or not. But um, and how long would you treat somebody with anticoagulants, uh, either post-vaccine or post-COVID? You know, during COVID, during acute COVID and high-risk patients, it was always in our protocols to do it preemptively. So that would be a noxaparin, a milligram per kilogram every 12 hours. So full dose. Don't even ask any questions, full dose. <clears throat> For the office post-COVID syndrome, post-vaccine syndrome, we use conventional anticoagulants that would be rivaroxaban or um, uh, 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 apixaban, uh, edoxaban, you know, the standard uh, ones. However, uh, in the setting of an acute thrombosis, some of them have higher doses. So the patient I had today is actually on Xeralto, but at that higher BID dose for a period of time, and then onto the standard dose, number one. Number two, I'm not seeing the standard resolution of thrombi as we would in the non-COVID era. Meaning with the respiratory illness and with the vaccines, these thrombi seem to be bigger, they seem to stay there longer, have a much harder time with the body's natural fibrinolytic system uh, to, to manage these. Some of these I'm getting worried about because they've been there for more than a year and they're large and they're still present. They're not responsive. Many uh, naturopathic holistic doctors are also trying to provide advice as we're stuck. We don't have any randomized trials about the addition of lumbricase or nanokinase. Uh, we're using full dose aspirin. I'm using you know all the conventional anticoagulants, but I am seeing these large thrombi, I don't know if you've seen the, the image of when they're taken out at, um, by embalmers, what have you, they're large, they're rubbery, they take on amyloidogenic type of properties. I'm seeing them clinically in my practice, and I am concerned. I mean, first thing I told the patient today is, listen, be prepared for a long course. This is not going to be three months. Thank you. Um, Dr. Sims, I had a question about the patient, the young girl with the Tourette's. I noticed that she had braces on, and she had said that her Tourette's had gotten worse recently, and I was wondering if there was a correlation of some of these issues getting worse when they were being treated orthodontically, and their arches are being constricted or whatever. Yeah, airways are constricted, there's, yeah. Um, yeah, all the things. Um, and um, what, so what do you, how do you advise patients in those situations? Because I noticed you made an orthotic that worked around her braces, but when the braces are making the problem worse, how do you discuss that with the patient in a political way? Just what, is, what are your thoughts on that? I, I tell the parents, take those braces off. <laughs> because, because what they're doing is they're, they're doing everything you just mentioned. They're constricting the airway, they're, they're uh, retracting the jaw, they're constricting the, the maxilla. The maxilla actually also contributes. Uh, a lot of times you think it's just the vertical, it's the maxilla also, depending on uh, how much constriction they're doing. Uh, um, Dr. <coughs> Gelb hit on it yesterday. Most maxillas are too small. They're way too small. You, what you will never find, what you will never find, I have not found one yet, and I've been doing this since 2007. <clears throat> Someone who has a class three jaw having Tourette's. Never. Why? Because their jaws are allowed to f go forward. They, they're, they're, their maxillas are compressed and squ squished and look like, you know, uh, the hulks, you know, grab their face. But no, you have to, you literally have to bring, bring them out. So 
I tell them, take those braces off because you're going to have to do it all over again. Uh, for Dr. McCullough and possibly others, I'd like to hear something about scientific censorship. My view being kind of optimistic in that I think the world might be bigger than they are and maybe we can get published in various journals and maybe the censoring journals might be shooting themselves in the foot, hopefully. So scientific censorship. Uh, it, it appears that there is some cracking of the ice and some manuscripts are starting to get through. Uh, you're speculating that there might have been overreach on the part of the editors in, and whoever's controlling all this. I don't see any signs of any of the journals having any indication of remorse. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I wish that the world was the way that you hope that it is. I don't, I don't see any signs of that. Um, and uh, I think what, what, what I see is some important uh, papers like Flavio's recently on ivermectin from Brazil that was severely uh, suppressed or um, some of the epidemiology studies that have been done on masks or other things are coming out in um, what would we would normally consider to be very marginal peer-reviewed journals, barely peer-reviewed, uh, yet they merit um, publication in a much higher level journal. And at the top, we clearly have a history in, in demonstration of a strong selection bias in manuscripts and a willingness to publish uh, what I think most of us would uh, consider in many cases to be papers that do not merit publication. Um, and uh, I have been profoundly struck by the willingness of uh, places like Lancet and New England Journal um, to really be all in on the narrative and all in on the censorship. And if that's, that's our leadership. So I wish things were the way that you hope that they are. I don't see any signs of that. I, I, what I see is a need for a new model for peer review. Um, and uh, I think it's important to remember historically, we didn't have these kind of uh, uh, almost mafia-like uh, relationships um, with uh, cliques of peer reviewers. Uh, historically, uh, going back over 100 years, you would publish your paper and then you would have the commentary from your community. Now it was, a, it was smaller communities and smaller number of publications. Um, and there's obviously a move towards more of a real-time peer review process that's more open sourced. I think that we're gonna have to rebuild um, accepted uh, journals and what we're up against is the uh, belief system of uh, evidence-based medicine uh, in, in this kind of wall that if it doesn't come out in one of the top 10% journals, then it's not worth considering. Uh, and, that, and who is making the determination about it's not worth considering? Well, it's, it's kind of, if you think about it, it's the MBAs, it's the folks that are running the hospitals because they now employ most of the medical care providers and so they set the standards and the medical care providers just have to comply with that. Um, so I, I wish that I saw a light at the end of the tunnel um, in terms of the peer review process. I, I've got multiple papers that, that um, there's interest in publication that have been sitting on preprint servers that are very high quality. Um, that just got rejected again and again and again and again um, after uh, editors had been willing at one point to publish them. So I, I just, I, for me, I'm kind of tired of it. It's a waste of time. Put it out on a preprint server. If anybody wants to see it, they can, and I move on. D Peter has, I think, published with Tracy Hogue. Um, Tracy Hogue is a, a casebook example, also Jessica Rose, of high-quality work that gets published and then has to be withdrawn because the editors just get barraged with basically scientific trolls. Um, 
so I, I, I don't see um, a happy endpoint here at this over the next you know few years, but I'm going to pass off to others. Well, one of, one of the things that I know with respect to the investigations that we started uh, after the 2005 DARPA conference on the weaponization of spike proteins associated with coronavirus is that we saw an unprecedented number of non-competitive grants that were evergreening. And what made these grants particularly important is that in the 2014 papers that were um, actually sent out to a number of research institutions around America, the waiver that was granted uniquely for SARS um, gain-of-function research, which was actually unique to SARS gain-of-function research. The other gain-of-function research largely was closed down, but each one of the institutions that were part of the collaborating consortium, about eight institutions, got waivers from NIID in October of 2014. So after the gain-of-function moratorium was announced, they got these evergreen provisions that let them get away with gain-of-function research. And the documentation is very interesting because the only recipients of those waivers were on ones that were non-competitive grants. And so while we talk about the publication problem, we also have an inventory problem, right? Part of the review process that is much, much more problematic is a lot of this stuff, Peter made the comment in his presentation, if you had the resources that some of these people have, you could actually do really great multi-center, you know, well-controlled clinical trials. But the problem is that in many instances, those are not available to be funded because they're actually coming out of awards where the award is already allocated almost entirely through a non-competitive agreement. And so when Fauci get his honorary doctorate, for example, last year at the commencement at UNC Chapel Hill, it was no surprise. If you look at the amount of money that he has actually given through non-competitive granting to that institution, UNC Chapel Hill basically has an endowment called Anthony Fauci. So no big surprise that they gave him an honorary doctorate. But what... Yeah. Yeah, so, so the point that I'm making is we, we've got to look at the holistic business of this thing because an enormous amount of what ultimately goes into what is accepted for publication is the reification of what will then be an evergreening grant process. And so having been in academic medicine for a long time, one of the things that I found out very early on, and I, I got screwed because I started off endowed, but the problem was all of my money was coming from corporate research. So I was getting paid by massive corporations to do the research I had. I wasn't doing the NIH hamster wheel, right? I didn't start with my you know, early stage NIH and early investigator stuff and then get up in my R01s and everything else. I actually had all my money coming from corporations. And what made that interesting is my work was much harder to publish because I wasn't in the grant to publication cycle. Now there was nothing empirically right or wrong about the work that I was doing. It was simply not part of the hamster wheel. And so having not been familiar with the grant incumbency, then my paper wasn't familiar to the same audience that was reviewing the paper when the work came out. And that's why the whole system, I, I'm in vigorous agreement with Robert that, that the structure of how we're doing it has to be re-examined at the publication level. But we have to also understand that the funding of research, which is the birth of what gives rise to publications, has to be a transparent exercise. And the moment that we make decisions, particularly in areas of public health and what we could call dual use research, those decisions have to be transparent at the funding stage. The minute those go to non-competitive permanent grants, we have a problem. Because then institutions become calcified around their dogma. They're not actually doing research anymore. They're endowing a dogma. And, and I think that's a part of the thing that we also have to address. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, as a, I was editor of two major journals uh, before all this happened, and through the course of the pandemic, it's in my book, uh, without any due process, no editorial board, no courtesy call, nothing. I just received emails that I was no longer the editor uh, of the journal. No thank you for increasing the impact factor or anything else. Um, and let me just tell you that <clears throat> something happened <clears throat> The, in this last few years, where it settled down over the medical literature process, including everything from origination of studies to 
uh, uh, investigation of drug applications with the FDA through Operation Warp Speed, the NIH, and CDC. And I uh, did the best I could. I got an FDA IND. I was the overall principal investigator of a big program with a Japanese product that we just, you know, we, we, we had everything all together. It was called Ramatriban, an anti-inflammatory, anticoagulant. Uh, and, and then ultimately saw all these grind out to not moving forward. We saw projects being done <clears throat> the best example to, to, to hear this was the cold corona trial. So in cardiology, we, we you know, pride ourselves on doing the largest, highest quality randomized trials, period. We blow away all the other specialties, all of them. And we said, listen, if, 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 oh, if, you know, if COVID is a, a huge disaster and we need randomized trials, we live and die by randomized trials, we're going to do the best randomized trial ever. And so the Montreal Heart Institute became the institute. So it does, it, it has a legacy of doing great clinical trials. They got Health Canada, and they got the NIH of Canada. They've got a whole variety of funding sources, <clears throat> and they powered up to do an outpatient <clears throat> clinical trial, United States, uh, Canada, and I think a few other countries, which is what we do. We do international clinical trials, prospective, <clears throat> double blind, randomized, multi center clinical trial, distributed all over these large regions. With, with an infrastructure of getting patients who turn COVID positive, getting the treatment versus placebo, uh, 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 electronic consents, everything done. I mean, the, it was the dream of doing an outpatient COVID study infrastructure. It was, it was powered at 6,000 patients, and the primary endpoint is hospitalization and death. It's the only randomized trial that was big enough set up the right way, <clears throat> definitiveness, the test agent they were going to test was colchicine, an, an anti-inflammatory uh, gout medication that inhibits microtubule formation. So we're off and running. We have press conferences. We have meetings. We recruit patients into studies. We have regional nodes. And, and we, we, we do our absolute best effort at this. Mysteriously, no one can explain it. The, the principal investor can't, investigator can't tell you. None of the clinical trials, infrastructure, uh, infrastructure people can tell you. But mysteriously, it stopped at 4,100 patients. Doesn't go to 6,000 patients. One of the funding sources in the co compilation of funding sources is the Gates Foundation. Okay. No one can say anything. Even the principal investigator is a good friend of mine. I said, what happened? He goes, I, I just don't know. It just, we were told that we had to stop at 4,100. So they stop at 4,100. They don't have the full sample size. And of those who are PCR positive, which is really because we had to enroll people without knowing if they were PCR positive yet. We always knew we were going to have an overall group and then those who really had the illness. There is a significant reduction in death and hospitalization at this 4,100. But it doesn't meet the global pre-stated primary analysis, primary endpoint. So the top line results of the study is that it's a neutral study. It didn't, didn't meet our high standards, although the real nuts of it, it was driven by a reduction in hospitalization. This is the largest prospective, double-blind, multi-center, randomized clinical trial in all of COVID-19. <clears throat> all of COVID-19. We do, we do the best we can. It's written up. It's submitted to the New England Journal of Medicine. The New England Journal of Medicine in the prior year, believe it or not, reported a case report of a normal uh, a woman having a vaginal delivery who is COVID positive. That is how low the New England Journal of Medicine went. It was publishing things that were ridiculously, you know, of no value to publish in the New England Journal of Medicine. This uh, Cadillac randomized trial comes into the New England Journal of Medicine and it sits there for months and months and months and months. You know, New England Journal of Medicine on a randomized trial will get it reviewed in 10 days and get a decision. Sat there for months. Then it moves on to JAMA. J it sits at JAMA for months. Months. And then it moves on to Lancet. And it sits on to Lancet for months. And it gets triaged down to a lower, uh, lower tier Lancet journal. And then it's published. I personally think that was intentional to delay and, and take away enthusiasm for a positive result of an outpatient trial, a clinical trial. And what's gone on over time is a massive suppression of early treatment. We've seen for the first time retractions of fully published papers that are contracted, publication fees, and everything, copyright, everything is done. Retraction of papers 
for no reason. I had one retracted uh, before it actually ever really got out in print. And, and the retractions are done not at the editorial level. They're done at the publisher level. So Elsevier, the world's largest publisher, has done it, and I've been on the re uh, receiving end of that. And we ask Elsevier, why would you retract the paper? Well, we're not sure we wanted it to begin with. Like, you can't do that. This is a <clears throat> publication. The only reason they can retract it is scientifically invalid. And I've seen it with Taylor and Francis. So the word on the street is, <clears throat> and I talk to all the young people all the time, in order to publish a paper on COVID, the introductory paragraph must say that the vaccines have saved millions and millions and millions of lives. They have to kind of prep it there. And then they get in and explain, well, now we're going to describe the horrible complication of myocarditis or something like this. Number two, what we've seen is that categorically the big journals are not going to do anything on anything that's going to help patients. It's vaccine only, that's it, or things that are horrible that could actually convince somebody to take a vaccine. And then we're gonna see a, a constant stream of basically ridiculous papers. In JAMA, for instance, a paper has been published looking at wastewater levels of SARS-CoV-2, of which, by the way, is ubiquitous in the sewer system, as you can imagine. And they've concluded by measuring it in pipe A versus pipe B that the vaccine was working over here and not working over here. I mean, it's that ridiculous. What's going on at the level, I can tell you as an editor, what's going on at this level is completely wide open. The editor of New England Journal of Medicine, Dr. Rubin, at the FDA pediatric meetings said, we're just gonna have to try it on the kids. We're not gonna know if the vaccine's ever gonna work. That's the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, so we must take these public utterances uh, 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 seriously. So what's come out of this? I've done a few things on Clubhouse, which is really fun, where all these people can just drop in. And you know what some young doctors over in, in Africa and other places of the world said? They said, Dr. McCullough, we don't care about the New England Journal of Medicine. We don't care about JAMA. Just anywhere, publish the data and let us look at it. And that's what we're hearing, just publish the data. So I think there's an opportunity. I agree with Dr. Malone. There's an opportunity. We just have to get things out there. And you know what? There's important findings on the preprint servers and, and a preprint server is a pre-publication way of getting the information out. My discipline is I just don't read the author's conclusions. Honestly, I just want to see the data and what, what happened. The NIH is doing this. You know, the NIH has a very important autopsy study of people who died with SARS-CoV-2 with shocking results of how long the virus is in the body. That's on the preprint server. They have another one. The NIH has one about post-vaccine neurologic injuries. So the preprint servers are wide open. Some of our papers, I agree with Dr. Malone, we have them on the preprint server. We go to eight or more journals. We still can't get them published. Uh, and then we're moving on to other lower tier journals. There's one uh, parent publisher that far and away is publishing the most breakthrough papers. And the parent publisher is MDPI. I just want to... I just want to echo what my colleagues have said. I'm, in fact, the suppression has gotten to the extent where you can't even get a rebuttal letter to the editor published. I've written several to uh, an anti-GM and to JAMA, to the American Family Physician. When I see nonsense about COVID, they won't, uh, they won't publish them at all. I've recruited my colleagues, the Americans, to do uh, homeopathy, which is like the homeopathic AMA. We've all written letters. Not a single one has been published. I also want to add something uh, to what Dr. McCullough was talking about, the treatment of coagulopathy. Just as in the patient I uh, presented where they had a genetically inherited uh, coagulopathy, I'm finding that I'm treating a lot of patients with long COVID syndrome. And you know, they're not particularly responding well to the, the second and third generation anticoagulants. Uh, like Pradaxin and whatnot, or even baby aspirin. And I'm finding in, in using the high dose uh, a pept uh, protease en uh, enzymes, not only um, the natokinase, but there's one called pl Plasmin X, which was produced by UCLA Harbor, uh, uh, Har Harbor General Cardiovascular Research Group. It's a special subfraction that's really potent. When you use a co you use a combination of the different enzymes, so you're hitting the clot from several angles, you get a really good, a really ra rapid clinical results. But you have to use a fairly high dose, like the normal dose of, of natokinase, for example, just to prevent a cardiovascular event. If someone has had high risk with atherosclerotic disease, as many one or two capsules a day. When you're treating these coagulopathies, DBTs, someone's had a PE or they're at high risk for it, they have high D-dimers, um, then, then you need something like 
uh, two or three capsules TID or QID. Uh, that higher dose is very, very effective. Now, I've, se I've seen people who have very significant thrombovitis who have a PE uh, and, and, they're, and they're not resolving very well get better within the course of two or three weeks where normally it might take months. So you have alternatives to use other than some of these other allopathic drugs which have significant side effects. As I mentioned earlier, you know, when you, when you have someone on one of these second or third generation anticoagulants, uh, especially an older person, if they hit their head, it's an irreversible anticoagulation and they bleed in their head. That's really problematic. That does not occur with natokinase, serapeptase, all these other enzymes. You stop them and the anticoagulant effect stops. Because you're really dealing, this is really a, uh, a, not a platelet disease, this is a fibrogen to fibrin disease. Those long stringy clots they're taking out of athletes' bodies, which they shouldn't be there, they're basically fibrin based. So aspirin and a lot of the other anticoagulants are not really gonna affect that. The enzymes do directly have a direct uh, fibrinolytic effect and will resolve the problem. So that's a tool you can use. Okay. Uh, we, we've got a I just wanted to say something to kind of tie this together. And it ties together what David was saying and what Peter's saying. Um, it isn't very amusing though. Um, uh, I cut my teeth at the Salk Institute um, at a time when there was half a dozen Nobel laureates. And one of the things I learned was that big science is run more like mafia. Um, it's, it's groups of affiliated in networks. They're often a principal investigator and postdocs. You can see that in Tony. Um, that's how he operates. Deborah Burks is a trainee. Um, Weissman, Drew Weissman is a trainee, the RNA vaccine guy from Penn. And, and they compete with each other as blocks. And one of the things they do is they share information. So if a, a former postdoc within a network get, receives a paper for review, that gets spread among that block of individuals. And you think that that peer review process has integrity. It absolutely doesn't, okay? And, and you have to kind of disabuse yourself of thinking that this is all fair and equal and, and uh, on the up and up. It's absolutely not. Just to kind of cap it off, this is why I've always wanted to, I always work with the DOD. People are like, oh, you must be controlled opposition because you work with the DOD. No, I work with the DOD because of two things. Number one, there's a lot less of that stuff than there is at NIH. And they're very focused on actually creating products to help the warfighter. That's their deliverable. That's why I like working with them. And the NIH doesn't care about any of that kind of stuff. But within, within that HHS world, this is, this is um, I don't know how else to say it, it is intensely corrupt. And uh, it has been for decades. It's that it's just become so florid in the current environment that it's easy to see. But, but I've been experiencing it, many of my peers have been experiencing it our whole professional lives. And just to cap it off, when I left the Salk, I was told by my PI, who eventually became the head of the Salk, and the editor of PNAS, um, and eventually was run out because of a long history of sexual transgressions with uh, people, employees and people in the, in the institute, he said to me, you will never get an NIH grant if you leave now. And I never did. Okay? That's, you, you, you need to understand how thoroughly controlled this entire financial network system is. And now it's clearly pervaded all the way through the editors and the journals themselves. They're all captured by pharma and these very large corporate interests. That's just the way it is. I have two questions. One is, uh, Dr. Sims, what's your experience with uh, patients with movement disorders, children with cerebral palsy, and um, adolescents with um, traumatic brain injury and movement disorders? And then second is, I'm going to bring up the GO question, the graphene oxide in these inoculations, if anybody has any knowledge or maybe I'm way out there. Thank you. I, I have not done any cere uh, cerebral palsy patients, 
uh, not as yet. So. But can I ask you a question? It seems like so many syndromes, like cerebral palsy, uh, there's ex excessive clenching, yeah. where we see just tremendous clenching in a variety of syndromes. It makes sense that that could be amenable to a, to a, a method that you have. And I agree. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. I agree. You, you could potentially make some people partially better, yeah, right? I mean, the generalizability is pretty good. Um, there is a uh, there is a cervical dystonia cases. Or I, I should say there are cervical dystonia cases <coughs> in which the neurological profession says it is um, uh, inherent. Okay. The one thing that they don't tell you is that those that have uh, uh, are that they that they believe are inherent are babies who are born through um, what do you call those uh, forceps? Thank you, forceps delivery. Now, if you grab a baby's head with forceps, where are the forceps going to be? Right here on the jaws, and they actually squeeze and pull the baby out. So what has happened is they're actually damaging, and there are statistics that say 66% of those uh, babies uh, uh, have cervical uh, or inherent dystonias. Now, uh, I, I, have, I have tried. I have tried. But, you know, they, I'm a dentist quote unquote. So do they listen to me? No. They, 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 their thing is, it's, it's, uh, it is only through the brain that uh, you can have these uh, difficulty problems. Cerebral palsy, I would love to try, but I haven't, I haven't, I haven't had a patient come this way for me. But I, I agree, the clinching can be uh, uh, detrimental or a factor yeah. as, uh, as one of the doctors told me it is a factor that could be the problem graphene oxide I'll turn it over <laughs> Where, who, who, who said graphene oxide I want to shoot myself um, uh, so, so uh, my friend Ryan Cole who's examined uh, like 40 of these clots um, and a very high, highly qualified pathologist uh, sees no evidence of any crystalline or refractive material in the clots. Full stop. So that also touches, we're going to go rec graphene oxide, we need to go to the metal. Um, uh, there's no question that fill finish irregularities uh, can lead to both metal chips and glass chips. It's well documented. Um, Merck got shut down for this once. The, the problem that I have with the graphene oxide story is that it keeps coming up. Graphene oxide is an environmental contaminant, and uh, the vials rarely, if ever, have a clean uh, chain of custody. In part because the uh, Pfizer and Moderna have enforced on all of the national regulatory authorities terms and conditions in the contract that prevent the national regulatory, th regulatory authorities from doing their job, which is normally they will do random sample of the lots that are shipped to verify purity, potency, and identity. And so they should be doing chemical analysis. They always do chemical analysis, and they're prevented from doing chemical analysis because of the contracts that have been executed that also absolve Moderna and Pfizer from any uh, liabilities. And in, as you may know, in some of those contracts, there's even terms that if the nation state fails to abide by the terms of the contract, they will forfeit national assets like airports and military bases and ports, okay? So it's that severe. Uh, and, uh, and so the, you can't get to the bottom of the graphene oxide story. This is why I, I get this question how, for two years now. Um, and what I have to always say is, 
I can't say because it is an environmental contaminant. We don't have clear chain of custody on these vials and those that are asserting it. Uh, and uh, it, we are prevented from the national regulatory authorities from doing their job, which would be normally to do this assessment by contract. Uh, and then the, the glass chips absolutely is a uh, occasional contaminant. It's a known problem with the fill finish process with these borosilicate vials. And in fact, that was a major contaminant in a lot of those withdrawn Japanese lots. So these glass chips that can find their way into a subset of patients. And so when I see, well, this pathologist in Italy or whomever said they found refractal material in the clots, I have to say, well, it's quite possible that they would see that and Ryan Cole would not see it in his samples because this is the way this kind of fill finish process runs. And uh, what we have in my estimate is a loosening of standards globally uh, in the rush to deploy these products and to move them through the manufacturing fill finish process. In terms of the metal filings, the, uh, the um, formulation of these products uh, with this lipidic component requires high pressure pumping through small orifices. And that's typically a stainless steel process. It's quite possible that over time when you're running this process again and again, you've exceeded the tolerance of a given pump and you may have metal filings contaminating the final fill and finish process. And again, the way that that would normally be handled is the regulatory authorities would be normal, would be doing random sampling to ensure purity, potency, and identity, and they're not doing it because they're blocked from doing it by contract. So it, you, this whole cluster of contaminant issues is basically unresolvable. It's just circular. We go over it again and again and again, and all you can, all you can do is uh, monitor what's happening in the clinical samples that come back from the patients or from these uh, autopsies or these um, embalmer uh, specimens. And, and say, well, what are we observing there? We clearly see aberrant clots with aberrant fibrin formation and polymerization, and we hear, just heard about their refractory characteristics in terms of normal clearance, and that literature is getting stronger and stronger and stronger right now. Um, so that's all I can say about graphene oxide is could be, could not be, there's no way for me to tell because we're prevented from doing the things that we would normally be doing because of the contracts that has been imposed on frantic regulatory authorities at the front edge that were all scared by all of the hype that was pushed and the fear that was pushed through the media. My question is for Dr. McCullough being a cardiologist. Um, our dental practice has seen a number of post-vaccine myocarditis, diagnosed myocarditis in young patients. My question to you is, how do we go back to our practices? How do we approach these um, patients? And do you have recommendations? They're asking us, what do I do? Are there any precautions as dentists and hygienists that we should be taking working on these diagnosed myocarditis patients? Myocarditis after COVID-19 vaccination, just a few quick words. Somebody asked me to present it today, and I, you know, that's a whole another topic. It's 90% males and it's 10% females. And by the way, myocarditis in young people is that same proportion for parvovirus and other giant cell and other causes, first point. Second point, the peak age with the COVID-19 vaccines is age 18 to 24, and that's established by a Kaiser study, Scharf and colleagues. However, in the Rose uh, paper that I'm involved in that was retracted uh, illegally, uh, it extends all the way up to men, all the way up into the 60s and 70s, so it's a big, skewed curve. So no one's uh, free of this. Uh, Bohmeyer in Germany has shown it's the spike protein directly in the heart muscle. It's physically there. So I mean, that's, that, so it, it is there. There are published fatal cases in the United States where, where, where it's fairly determined that in fact the young people have died and that's Gill in Connecticut, that was Choi in Korea, and in uh, Verma in Washington University in St. Louis. That was New England Journal of Medicine, by the way. You know, fatal uh, vaccine-induced myocarditis early in, in the experience. 
The paper that <clears throat> was kind of a bombshell paper came out of Bangkok, Thailand. Manugian is the first author published in this M MDPI kind of journal family. But they did the first prospective cohort study. Everything I've told you before is spontaneous reporting. But they did the first prospective cohort study, which the, regulatory, which the FDA asked the, the companies to do. In their biological licensing agreement letters that Pfizer and Moderna had, they said, listen, you can move forward and get approved, but you must do prospective cohort studies on myocarditis and tell, you how, tell how frequent it was. What Manugium did is on the second shot of Pfizer, and given in people aged 13 to 18, at baseline, they did an EKG, cardiac troponins, a cardiac echo, and they used the same equipment we use in the United States. This is not third world stuff. This is state of the art, high sensitivity troponin by Roche, you know, if, if Siemens or, or GE imaging. And in those with suspected myocarditis, they did cardiac MRI, state of the art, state of the art. What they found was astonishing that about 29% of the kids, and this is with the second shot of Pfizer, they do all this at baseline, and then they do it, I think, on day three, day five, and day eight afterwards. So it's a thorough assessment on what's going on. 29% of the kids actually had some cardiovascular symptoms. So, you know, parents could you know, attack a cardia, they, they potentially have some chest. So there's actually a pretty big circle of symptoms. And then 2.5% actually met a multi dimensional. Uh, definition of myocarditis, 2.5%, 2.5%. You know, that's astonishing. That would be 25,000 cases per million. The, the Kaiser study said it was 537 per million. The CDC said it was going to be 66, 62 per million. We're now talking 25,000 per million. I mean, this is <clears throat> massive. Right. So this, right. So this is Pfizer. There is one comparative paper. I think it's Husby and colleagues showing that Moderna versus Pfizer. Moderna is, you know, three times the amount of mystery. Moderna actually does have higher myocarditis rates than Pfizer. So this was Pfizer. Just the second shot of Pfizer, not the first shot of Pfizer. The second one only. Now of this, the kids who developed myocarditis, uh, 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 two kids were hospitalized. To just give you an idea. So just if you're paying attention to what's going on and you do a study of 300 to 400 people, there's going to be a couple of kids hospitalized in a prospective cohort. So this, this is the first prospective cohort study done uh, in this post-vaccine deployment era. <clears throat> the other finding was a sizable portion of the kids who had myocarditis actually was subclinical. They weren't in that circle that had symptoms. This is the most concerning finding of all, meaning a child is going to get a vaccine, maybe have some constitutional symptoms like fever and body aches, but in fact they're having real heart inflammation. So subclinical myocarditis, that's, uh, uh, that's on the second shot. And it's additive. And this, yeah, so this is just, well, you know, this is the Manugian study. <clears throat> so the concern, the great concern that's going on right now is there may be large numbers of people that are sustaining heart damage with the vaccines that don't have symptoms that would ever cause them to be evaluated for it. They're walking around with some scar formation in the heart and they are set up for an arrhythmia. Dr. Catagiani in Brazil gets credit for, he did a very nice paper putting this together. With this type of heart damage, the trigger for sudden death is athletic activity. In fact, in our literature before of all of COVID, we always said if we had a parvovirus case or a giant cell case of myocarditis, no physical activity, period. And then we use some drugs to try to settle down the myocarditis, and if heart failure, we use heart failure drugs. So it was always in our literature to never play sports. Now this broad application of vaccination to young people taking it, a sizable fraction with no symptoms, going out and playing sports. That's the conundrum that we're in right now. So one practice in Virginia, I believe, just said, listen, we're gonna measure EKGs and troponins uh, on kids. We're gonna try to do something, some type of an encatchment to try to catch people in doing this. All I can say as a dentist or a dental hygienist is be aware of this, document, it, and every single patient I see, I document when they had their vaccines. I mean, it takes time, but I do it. Very importantly, I document whether or not they have COVID. I agree with Dr. Malone. I think this is all cumulative, and I would count, count COVID in there too. Remember, the, the, there was a Big Ten study done in 2020 before the vaccines because we, they were worried about the athletes getting COVID myocarditis. Now, in this giant study, thousands and thousands of athletes, uh, there was a total of six athletes that had a troponin above the upper limit of normal, and 2.5% had 
findings on an MRI that honestly I think looked spurious. There were no large regions, nothing characteristic of myocarditis, and it was inconsequential. None of these athletes were hospitalized and none of them died. So in, in, in the world of pretty thorough research in athletes with COVID respiratory illness, it looks like Honestly, the respiratory illness is not the immediate threat, although it may be, it's probably a much lower spike protein exposure than the vaccines. The vaccines, it looks legitimate. This most recent study is extremely disturbing. Uh, I would uh, ask about vaccination. I would ask about COVID respiratory illness. Uh, using epinephrine and, and all the, the things that you use in the dental office, I'd be cautious within the 30 days of receiving a vaccine. The last thing you'd want to do is have some kid with some clinical myocarditis, load them up with a bunch of epi, and then have an arrhythmia in the office. I think that's probably where you're getting to. Um, well, if they're already diagnosed by a cardiologist and they have myocarditis, should we be pre-medicated? Should we be, what should we be doing? Well, boy, I, I tell you, I wouldn't be using epinephrine if, unless you really, really have to. Um, uh, you know, I may be just creatively, some of these patients, probably more than half right now, I have on beta blockers anyway. So we may just have on beta blockers and say, listen, go ahead and use the local epi and we'll, we'll try to, you know, uh, do it. Sometimes, and I, I'm, my office is right next to a dental school. <laughs> Sometimes what we'll do is we'll just say, listen, in this case, instead of doing the community office, let's do it at the dental school and we'll have monitoring of anesthesia there and have the patient on a monitor. Just taking some extra precautions because this sudden death risk and the subclinical myocarditis is so real. I, I just can't tell you how large of a problem it is. Recently, one of the international sports uh, c uh, committees analyzed the number of sudden deaths that they annually see in all these athletes worldwide. And you know, many soccer leagues, rugby leagues, whatever. The answer is, for the world, there's 39 sudden deaths per year in all the years on average up to COVID. One, and that includes actually the first year of COVID. Once they got to the vaccines, that number is roughly 700. Oh, God. That gives you any idea of the size of this problem. That's the reason why Novak Djokovic would have you and, 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 and uh, Aaron Rodgers and Cole Beasley and Kyrie Irving are just saying, listen, sorry, I'm not taking it because of this risk. And were there precautions before dental cleaning that were inducing bacteria into the bloodstream often? No, I don't think so. I mean, just the standard. Uh, you, you probably are, are aware. There's a big rift in cardiology, by the way, about um, the endocarditis uh, prophylactic guidelines. So when the most recent set of guidelines came out, which are now old, they had this giant cataclysmic uh, uh, shift saying, oh, we don't need to use prophylactic antibiotics anymore. There aren't any large prospective randomized trials. And that actually came by, from Kevin Campbell from Duke, who I know, who, you know, within two years of being a fellow, joined the pharmaceutical industry, but he got in, char in charge of chairing this guideline. It's the most ridiculous thing in the world. We don't have large randomized trials for uh, an antibiotic prophylaxis because it's impossible to do it. It's such a sporadic thing, right? So we used our clinical judgment. Since those guidelines were eased, there's been a ton of endocarditis, which is a giant mistake. I've never let off my foot off the gas. I use prophylactic endocarditis now as the same way I did back in the 1980s. I have not changed one bit because of the fact that I've, been, I've seen patients have their lives destroyed with dental-induced endocarditis because people let off the guidelines. One last question real quick. Kind of we have to wrap up. Uh, this is for Dr. David Martin. How can people support you in your efforts? Well, the good news is that thing that I read at the beginning of our um, speech that we had to read, I actually live by. Um, my wife and I supported all of our work. Um, and we did that because we actually didn't want to be anybody else's mouthpiece or spokesperson or anything else. So that was actually something that we made as a conscious decision. And we're very grateful that we did it because in the two years, including pandemic and all that kind of stuff, everybody tried to find the puppet strings somewhere. It was, who is he really working for? Because, I mean, like Robert said, you know, if you go back and look at my bio, you know, I've worked with the Department of Defense, the Office of Naval Research, the CIA, and the FBI, and everything else. If you want the alphabet soup, not only do I admit to it, but I can tell you the dates and times of the briefings. Um, and, and so everybody was going to look for something. And so we made a commitment to get to the federal case. We wanted to make sure there was no financial line anybody could draw at all, and we did that. 
Um, where we are now in the support of now going after the felony murder prosecutions, which we are now beginning, um, many of the jurisdictions where we're doing these felony murder investigations don't have the budget inside of counties or cities to bring on the expertise that's required to go after what is a rather complex murder case. And so what we are now doing, and this is, by the way, just a few days old, at prosecutenow.io, which is the website where we're soliciting all the patient information and the sheriff's information and everything else. Now there is a way to donate to help underwrite with private funds sheriff's offices that can't go to their counties for appropriation because many times you may have a law enforcement officer who's happy to do their job, but when they go to the county board of supervisors or they go to somebody else to actually get the check written, the, the project gets killed because they don't get funding. And so what we are doing right now is we're, when we go to a sheriff or a DA now, we're saying this will be an investigation that will cost your department nothing. And we're very, very fortunate. We have one very large donor who stepped up very early in the process um, and provided a significant amount of underwriting. But that is going to take a lot of resources because we are actually promising to a sheriff's office or promising to a DA that we will do this at no cost to their county. And that's a big promise to make because we don't know how much the cost will be for that particular exercise. We had one county where we had two known plaintiffs' deaths. And the minute we actually opened up the investigation, we found 11. Now, imagine what happens when you think about, you know, if it's a murder trial for one, it's one thing. If you've got 11, now all of a sudden you're going after potentially a number of parties where you know, we thought it was going to be a hospital and we thought it was going to be a physician. Now it's a whole bunch of things. And so the costs are going to go up. So prosecutenow.io is where we're taking funds. What's important to recognize in that is those funds are used only for supporting the public prosecution of the felony crimes. We, we don't use those for private legal expenses. All the private legal expenses we're still <laughs> covering now through funds that we actually um, personally control. And so there's no, there's, no, um, there's no way right now that we're doing anything. And, and because we are where we are in the federal case, um, we want to get to the decision on the preliminary injunction. Because remember, if we win the preliminary injunction, the CMS mandate goes away. And that, that's a beautiful objective. And, and the good news is I think we're going to get that ruling relatively quickly. And the fact that we will be able to do that and honestly say that no activist agent, no political party, no organization that had an axe to grind, that, that case will be decided 100% on no external funding that had any other agenda whatsoever. This is going to be a, I, I mean, I guess if you look at me and Kim and go, well, you have an external agenda. Our agenda is actually fighting for something that no one else decided to fight for. And the, that's our agenda. So if you want to get me on that, that's what it is. But, but the importance that we put on that is really actually quite strong because we don't want to be labeled as a political or a social or a, a cause-oriented anything. We're doing this because it's the right thing to do. And so if now you involve yourself at prosecutenow.io, those funds will be used for municipal law enforcement support of the active felony murder investigations that we now have, um, a number of them now in process. So. Um, that's where it is, and, and I, would, I would actually, I'm very clear on the fact we're not soliciting anything. If people want to help, that's fine. We are actually doing nothing in terms of active solicitation. So it's something that people are motivated to do it, that's great. But we have the foundation now set up inside of Prosecute Now so that there is no personal enormment to any one of the people in the organization. We're, we're only doing this to underwrite the uh, public sector failing in communities where we can't get budgets for sheriffs and DAs. So great. Thank you so much. Let's give them all a round of applause. Just thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Really appreciate it.